Welcome to episode 23 of the Hunt Back Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. In this week's episode, we're talking with Kenton Carruth of the hunting apparel company First Light. We get the lowdown on all of First Light's new offerings for 2016, including some new merino wool items as well as new outerwear. Some ultralight stuff, some stuff for the whitetail hunter. There's something for everybody in the First Light lineup. We're excited to talk about the new products. But before we get to that, let's do something we haven't done in a few episodes, and that's give away some Exo Mountain Gear swag. So, Bird Hunter Joe, thanks so much for the iTunes review. Because of that, you're this week's swag giveaway winner. Shoot us your email to podcast at exomountaingear.com, and we'll be sure to hook you up. If you, the listener, want to enter into these giveaways, it's really simple. All you have to do is leave us a review on iTunes, or email us your questions or feedback to podcast at exomountaingear.com. As always, you can check the show notes for this episode at exomountaingear.com forward slash 23. In these episode notes, we'll have links to the First Light lineup, the 2016 First Light catalog, and more. All right, on to the show. Hope you enjoy it. The Hunt Pack Country Podcast is proudly brought to you by Exo Mountain Gear, makers of ultralight, ultra-tough packs that are designed to do what you love most, hunt the backcountry. Exo Packs are designed for efficiency, simplicity, and durability that's backed by a lifetime warranty. To learn more about Exo Mountain Gear, please visit www.exomountaingear.com. All right, Ken, welcome to the Hunt Back Country Podcast. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Oh, man. It's our pleasure. We had uh, some technical difficulties, as tech seems to do, but we're here now and excited to talk with you. Right on. So, you know, I'm sure that a good portion of the guys listening to this are going to be um, familiar with First, First Light. Hopefully, a bunch of them are more than familiar and have actually used your stuff. But, you know, I guess to give some context and history, especially for those guys who are new to First Light, can you kind of explain? Give us a brief, you know, history of the company, um, why you got started and, you know, what you got started with from a product perspective. Sure, sure. Um, basically, we live at, we live in a mountain town um, at about 6,000 feet. And, you know, both Scott, my business partner, and I um, came from the outdoor ski snowboard world. That's what we worked in. And, you know, I mean, I started working in a ski slash snowboard shop probably uh you know 93 i was a buyer by 94 so i've gotten to see you know pretty much everything that came through um it was about 2002 or 2003 that i we really started to get into um the merino the, the merino wool it really moved kind of into the outdoor winter space starting starting then in in earnest i mean it always had kind of been around but it hadn't been super popular until then yeah. so we started wearing it you know subbing out the poly pro and and other you know good products for the merino and it was great because it didn't smell and it just kind of felt better next to skin um both of us were super avid archery hunters and then you know didn't take but one or two summers to where we realized wow you know we really need to uh this would work way better for archery hunting than our existing products you know Mm -hmm. so it probably took about another i don't know probably started wearing about 2002 or three archery hunting and then um the project started around 2005 we started talking about it but it proved to be very difficult to print on the merino wool. Um, nobody had really done it in bulk, and um, the merino itself just didn't like taking ink. So, after so in terms probably, of like printing a camo pattern. Exactly. Yeah, okay. So then after probably a year and a half of trial and error, we finally got it printed. Um, printed with a good hand, so it felt good, and um, and it had it held up to you know UV, and it washed well. Um so then that was that was about you know we get, we got the product in hand probably a month before shot in ATA and then I went to ATA and shot in 2007 um with basically a you know four or five pieces I you know just put them in my luggage you know it's funny now we have a 
a semi truck basically full. <laughs> but <laughs> so at that point in time, you're you're launching the complete company with like four or five pieces, all of oh, which man. are just a hundred percent merino. That's it, hundred percent merino with five pieces, and was, it, it was yeah. Go ahead, sorry. No, you're good. That you know, it seems to me to overgeneralize to some extent that you know the hunting market. Um, is behind the general outdoors market, at least the cutting edge of it. And I think, you know, we're getting better for sure. But going back to that point in time, was Merino, I don't want to say a tough sell, but was it even understood back at that time? You show up to ATA show and what was that, 07, 08? I would imagine people are... 07, yeah. yeah. You know, it was funny. People that got it were like, I, I can't believe that it took this long for somebody to come out with this, right? And people that didn't get it... They thought we were we were gonna have a wool sweater or something. They they really didn't have any idea what it was. So, you know, fortunately we were we were so small then that that there was plenty of people that had already been using it, you know, for other activities that they bought everything up right away. And we, I mean, we was we didn't have a lot to sell. We were so started small, but we sold everything, you know, yeah. and and, okay. and and that helped get the ball rolling. You know, there was just enough people to where. Uh, we didn't have to spend any money on advertising, you know. Um, and fortunately, you know, it's funny as as time went along, other companies started doing us uh, doing it. I think we had we didn't really have our first competition until 2010 or 11, where another company in the hunting industry started to do merino, and we were kind of nervous about it because we thought, oh man, you know, these guys have so much more money. You know, this is a company that was owned by a large company, mm-hmm. and and in fact, it was. It was probably the best thing for us. It, it, essentially, I think it validated the concept. You know, yeah. instead of having you know people think some two weird dudes from Idaho are selling these camo sweaters, all of a sudden, uh, a company that was more established than us started making it um, their products in merino, and everybody was started to really pay attention. and And subsequently, the next year, we offered outerwear, and and it's been solid ever since. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I could see that bringing some, you know, legitimacy to the larger market. Yeah, it's funny how sometimes you think that, you know, a, a, a curse is it turns into a kind of a blessing. So that uh, that was good, and um, yeah, yeah, so here we are. That's cool. So I, I don't want to, you know, we've talked about merino. I don't want to skip this without, you know, helping guys understand the benefits of merino specifically to hunting because there are some. Um, and so what are some of those things that make Merino specifically a great product for um, hunting and, you know, especially bow hunters? The biggest deal, I, mean, I want to say the, 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 the three biggest things are, one, for hunting, it, it just does not retain odor. So you can wear the, the same shirt for days and days and days before it starts to smell, you know. Like you can go on a pretty heavy trip with two shirts and, you know – in the middle of the day, if 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 you have water close, you just wring it out in water, and it's like putting on a fresh shirt, you know. Mm-hmm. And it it just it doesn't they just don't smell. And two, um, it's just the way it regulates your body temperature. Merino is unique in the fact that when you're hot, it does its best to cool you down, and when you're cold, it traps the air and does its best to keep you warm. And and it, it can't really be understated, you know. It, being comfortable it's you're just a level more comfortable than you would be otherwise you know um it doesn't shine when the sun hits it it's got a bunch of smaller benefits but basically the the ability to kind of regulate your body temperature and uh and not smell for us that was enough to start a company yeah for sure yeah so new now in 2016 there's sort of a new evolution um with the arrow wool. And so can you kind of explain that concept for us? It's kind of uh, an advanced Merino, if you will, right? Right, right. And, you know, I can't take full credit for this because there's been some other company in the outdoor industries that have been using similar technologies. What's unique is that we figure out how to print on it. Um, it, It's exceedingly difficult to print on Merino. And then when you add an, uh, uh, Synthetic, so our 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 stuff's about one third Kakona uh, or thirty seven point five and two thirds Merino, but it's uh, it's it's what's called an intimate blend. We don't wind, we don't encase, uh, we don't encase the synthetics with wool. We basically blend the wool and the and the synthetic together, so that it's just you know everything's 
it's a it's a it's called an intimate blend. So mm-hmm. essentially, the trick is is that you have to print on two dissimilar fabrics, and I think that that that's been kind of a stumbling block. And it took us a while to figure it out. We'd been testing these products, this product, the the one third synthetic, the one third thirty seven point five, and the two thirds uh, merino for a long time. I mean, four plus years, okay. and we really liked it, especially in the thinner weights. It um, it seems to make it, it allows us to make it a little bit thinner because um, pure merino. If you get any thinner than about one seventy weight, it becomes fragile. Okay. So for starters, it allowed us to make a thinner piece that had that had more strength, and it also allowed us to make a piece that dried faster because. Um, you know that's kind of the one thing with merino is that it doesn't dry as fast as synthetics and people say oh you know i like synthetics because of this well synthetics do dry faster they get stinkier though and even when they're when they're wet merino still feels better you know it has a better next to skin so we really that was kind of the holy grail to to create a to create a really really technical hot weather piece and that's how we came up with uh with the arrow wool okay so, you know, at first glance, um, it looks like some of the new items that are offered in the Arrow Wool, um, like the Wilkin, which is a QZ, and then you guys already have a QZ, which, you know, appears to be a similar weight. What are some of those differences in helping a guy decide which one he should maybe go for, um, the Arrow Wool versus the, you know, 100% Merino option? Well, the, 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 so the Wilkin's about 145 grams per inch. Um, it is, designed to be worn you know in hotter weather whereas the uh the yano series is about 170 175 um so you know it's definitely the yano series is made to provide a little more more warmth than the the arrow wool okay. the arrow wool stands for arrows aerobic wool you know but the arrow wool is designed to be worn when it's as hot as you know it's it it's, it can be worn as an underlayer for, you know, obviously freezing cold, but sure. it's designed for, you know, specifically those days when it's, you know, 65, 70, all the way up to 100. Depends, you know, as hot as it's going to get. But, um, but you know, for hotter days, then, the, then it, it's designed to perform better in hot weather. Let's just say that. Sure. So the new the new arrow wool stuff isn't going to replace some of the items that you know guys might be familiar with in your line in terms of the hundred percent you know merino wool layers. You know, I don't think so. I think a lot of the guys like the merino. It definitely won't replace the two thirty and the four hundred weights sure. um, um, because those really work well, you know, in their own. In fact, the four hundred weights an interesting piece i'll just briefly touch on this but it's funny because you know you get guys that see the 400 weight vest and they and they and they look at just the numbers and they say well it's not as warm as a puffy and it's heavier than a puffy so why would i get it Mm -hmm. but the fact is is what where pieces like where the merino really shines is in fact regulating your body temperature so if you've got you know a hike where you're you've got to go up and down a bunch of different hills you know if you have a puffy on certainly if you have a a, a down puffy which doesn't breathe at all you're going to be transitioning back and forth and back and forth you know and you might have saved a little weight whereas the thing that's nice about the merino even the thicker merino if it's chilly you'll still be able to get to the top of whatever you're doing provided it's just not you know you're not putting out a super hard effort and then you get there and you get to the top and you stop and you're, and you're still comfortable you know you're not constantly transitioning layers and and that's the thing that makes the merino unique is that it it really does perform in a quite a large temperature variation you know temperature variations yeah okay yeah that's great to know so on the merino side um you know, w- let's stick there now. We'll get to outerwear. But what are your summer? You know, some of your recommendations for in general a guy who's you know hunting Rocky Mountain West in September. Obviously, temps can vary, but what are some of those go-to pieces that you're always pointing people to? You know, in the um, you know elk season, portions of mule deer season in September. You know, I, I mean the the merino next to skin is by far the you know basically my kit that i wear regardless is i'll wear a uh, merino boxers the compression socks and then the um and then a long sleeve uh thin merino shirt you know if it's going to be 
if it's going to be super hot, I'll wear the I'll wear the uh, the arrow wool. Or and if it's going to be you know probably not going to get any hotter than sixty and starts off cold, I'll usually wear the yano next to skin. But I always wear one of the two thin layers next to skin, you know, and then kind of go out from there. Um, around here, the canabs are pretty tough to beat because we don't have a lot of nasty stuff that can kind of beat up clothes you know Mm -hmm. um whereas some guys you know certainly guys that are in oregon and washington have a lot more texas they get a lot more spiky stuff and they can kind of beat up the canabs um so then in that in which case the corrugates would probably be a better choice but you know it's it, it for archery elk rare is it that i i would wear anything other than those two pants you know even if it's you know, we've had it snow a foot opening weekend. Even if it does that, I'll just put gaiters on, you know. But you're kind of on the move at all times. So you really want to keep it keep it relatively light. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about some of those bottoms. Um, you know, the, the canab, that's, you've had that since the beginning, right? When you hit ATA in, what, 07, you had a version of the canab. Is that right? We actually, we didn't have, we had a... The first pant came about in 2010, oh, okay. and it was um, essentially at, at OR, Outdoor Retailer, we saw a, a backpack, and it had this um, – uh, it had the the ripstop wool, and that's when we kind of got the idea, so we started testing it. But we didn't have the canabs until 2010, I believe. Okay. Um, and the sizing on the canabs was a little tough. You know, it was kind of our first foray into that. And um, the first year, they were kind of small. And then the second year, we made them a lot larger and uh, seemed to fit a lot more people. But the the cool thing about the canabs is, is the canabs are like dead nuts quiet. Like you can't make the canabs make noise, basically. I mean, you know, you got to break a branch. It's And, and for a lot, of, a lot of guys that are, that are doing uh, – like trad stuff and, you know, hunting, you know, coups or especially like super skittish game, the canabs become really critical. The the corrugates are, I mean, compared to everything else, they're definitely on the quiet side, but but they're nothing like the canabs. I mean, the canabs are, are as quiet as can be. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to say that something's silent, which is from a marketing perspective, it's thrown out a lot, but we're talking about the canabs. I mean, truly they're silent. Like as you said, you pretty much can't make them make noise. Right. Exactly. But you know, guys were beating them up and, and guys that were hunting in certain places where there's a lot of briars or whatever. So we had to come out, um, with something that would work in more nasty terrain, you know? And so the corrugates were another thing, you know, it, the corrugates are nylon. Um, if you look at most high-end mountaineering pants, you know whether it be uh, Mammut, Marmot, Arteryx, all their nice trekking non-laminate pants are are nylon. But nylon's another thing that's tough to print on. So then everybody has been kind of stuck wearing poly hunting pants for since you know since we've tried to start making nice stuff, you know, from the get go because poly is easier to print on. The mm-hmm. problem with poly is, is it's nowhere near as strong as nylon. Um, it doesn't breathe as well as nylon. Um, so that was a big deal. And, and, and we really kind of resisted coming out with a synthetic pant until we could make top shelf stuff. So our, our kind of theory has been if our stuff, you know, if we were to make our stuff in, you know, blue or, you know, purple. And if it can't hang on the shelf next to top end gear, then we're coming up short, you know? Right. I mean, and, and, and in fact, you know, you'll see our stuff at outdoor retailer. It's funny, you know, 37.5, they'll feature our stuff because in certain times, certainly in technology regarding, uh, insulations and the way we apply insulations, um, we have, we have leapfrogged the traditional outdoor industry, which whenever that happens, I, that makes me really happy, you know, because, um, I don't want to have to be the follower. I don't, you know, I, I want the people to look to us to, 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 to find great ski clothes or whatever, you know, yeah. we, we're in a situation to where hunters in general, to where there is no lodge or there is no, you know, shelter. Like when you go out in the woods, 
you know, a lot of times it's hours to get back. So if the gear doesn't work properly, it um, it can really be dangerous, you know. So for us too, it's all of our stuff gets tested. I mean, ex- extensively. I mean, all our guys are now starting to wear 17 stuff or try 17 stuff because I don't want to come out with something and have somebody say, oh, you know, you're guinea pigging on the on the uh on the consumer you know so right i don't know yeah no i mean i hear you i mean that's that's critical for sure and as you said right. I mean, that's a great point you know when you're hunting you don't have the luxury of skipping out like you might on a lot of other outdoor activities where you can go oh it's a crap day i'm just gonna you know not sure. go whatever especially you know guys who a lot of our listeners do are making multi-day trips like you're gonna deal with whatever comes and you need to be prepared for whatever comes. So from a weather perspective, yeah, it's absolutely essential that, you know, your clothing can withstand that and keep you safe and as comfortable as possible. Right. I mean, even, you know, if you're backcountry skiing or you're sledding, you know, you get to a point where if it's, you know, something kind of weird, you can turn around and kind of go back the same way you can far easier, you know, whereas with hunting, you're on your feet and, you know, however deep you are, it's going to be, I mean taking elevation out of the equation but it's going to be just as long to walk back out you know and so i don't know i and i think largely you spend probably larger chunks of time outside so you know it's a big deal for us to have stuff that works yeah so one thing that's been cool to see you know when i started using first light it pretty much was just merino um, and then you started to roll out some of these outerwear pieces, um, featuring Kakona, you know, what we now have is 37.5. You know, I know there's different aspects to that, but in general, um, why did you guys, when you were developing this outerwear line, choose to partner with Kakona and use these technologies? Um, and then how do they work? Well, for us, what we started to find out was that, um, a lot of these companies really make quite waterproof stuff they do a pretty darn good job of making waterproof stuff um you know it's not uncommon to get um you know every to to get something that's 20 rated at 20k waterproof you know and in fact if the test stuff to failure a lot of the stuff you know our stuff and other stuff will go clear up to 40 what um what was unique about kokona was that it was it breathed extraordinarily well and what we kind of found was that a lot of times guys put on their rain shell and they continue to put out as hard of an effort you know as they had previously but they get sweaty from the inside out and they're you know they'll they'll get somewhere and be like gosh this stuff's not waterproof where in fact it is quite waterproof it's just that once you put a shell on you your breathability goes down significantly. Um, no matter what it is, you know, Kokona, our stuff breathes better than anything on the market by a solid 15 plus percent. Um, it's still a shell and you got to realize that, you know, no matter how well it breathes, it's not going to breathe as well. Once you put a laminate on, it's not going to breathe as well, you know, but, um, after testing a bunch of stuff and just kind of looking at, you know, basically you, we we go to outdoor retailer and all the suppliers are there. So you get to kind of see everything. And um, after, you know, talking to a bunch of people, trying a bunch of stuff, I mean, we have so many jackets in the office from other companies and whatever we have to try out um, that we thought that the Kokona stuff, it just seemed to work just that much better. And, and um, so far so good. Yeah. So you mentioned two ratings, um, you know, breathability and then <clears throat> the waterproofness. Um, and those can have specific numbers on them, which is one thing I think is awesome that you guys publish with um, garments that have, you know, those relevant fabrics. As you actually show, this is like 42K breathability and, you know, 30 whatever water resistance. Can right. you talk a bit about, um, you know, that wh- how that's tested and what that really means? Well, basically, it's... Um, <laughs> You know, we could spend hours on this, but basically, it's kind of an industry standard. It's a JIS. It's a Japanese. It's industry standard that they've kind of tried to, um, they've tried to come up with. So, you know, a, a, 
the quality of a laminate could be tested. And by a laminate, I mean, generally speaking, when you've got a waterproof breathable, say if it's a three layer, you've got, you know, one layer of fabric next to skin, a layer, a laminate, and then a layer on top of it. Um, you know, that would be your basic three layer. The Kokona stuff adds a third thing. They basically spray it with a carbon, um, a carbon based, um, well, they spray it with like a carbon-based um, spray, basically, that bonds to the fabric, um, essentially giving it a bunch more, well, 800% more um, surface area. Plus, it also works to regulate the temperature from the inside out. So if something is, um, if you're more humid inside, Kokona physically pulls it to the outside. But back to the numbers, the numbers were basically a way of um, justifying how well or or testing and being able to have, you know, data on how well something um, breathed or was waterproof. So basically with the, with the waterproofness, they basically, um, they basically put, you know, a, 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 a tube on top of the fabric and then as much as they fill the tube up, how long it takes it or how much pressure it takes to push through the garment, that's how they determine how waterproof it is. Breathability is kind of the opposite. They, um, they determine how much moisture vapor um, that, the water, that, that can transfer from the, outside, from the inside to the outside, and that's how they determine breathability. But, um, you know, I, I, I think that it's, a, it, it's got its flaws, but I think for the most part, it is pretty indicative of what it does. You know, for, unfortunately, some Companies kind of like to um, they manipulate the they manipulate their results. For instance, so like on a, when we, whenever we test something, like when we send stuff to get tested, we test our garment off the line with camouflage because the printing can have an effect on the uh, overall number. You know, sure. um, we don't send uh, uh, just the laminate, or we don't send a um, somebody else's Kokona piece and, and, and say, Hey, this is, you know, what we get. Cause you know, there's plenty of companies that make stuff that are ultra lightweight that could pass a lot of moisture. When you, when we advertise the numbers that we tested, those are the numbers that the garment you are buying is getting. Um, so that's kind of a big deal for us because like I said, you know, you'll get people with these radically inflated numbers and, we test everybody else's stuff too, you know, because somebody will say, oh, you know, we get, we're twice as waterproof. And then we test it and find out it's 20% less waterproof and 20% less breathable. And it's kind of like, geez, you know, yeah. what, where do you get these numbers from, you know? Yeah. No, that makes a ton of sense. That's interesting to know. Um, you know, it, for example, as you mentioned, like you could take just the laminate straight from Kakona and test that and get one number. But what you're totally. doing is taking that laminate, putting it in your product with the other layers, if you will, printing it with, you know, the finish that you're going to have. And then, as you said, taking the off the line, finished first light off the hanger, essentially product and testing that, right? Exactly. And that's going to get a different number. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's, you know, by the time, you know, you've got glue on both sides, there's all, there's quite a bit of things that come into play, you know, but that's the number we, we advertise like the the, the piece that you're going to get, you know, it's right. not, we're not cooking the books. Yeah, for sure. That's interesting to know. And it, it's also cool, you know, I'm just going back through the catalog now and, and looking at some of these new options, which we definitely want to talk about. But, um, you know, I, I just, I can't pass it up and say too, for guys who aren't familiar with the line, um, you know, it's something I've been wearing for years. One of my favorite pieces is the puffy, um, the uncompagre puffy, um, Talk a little bit about, you know, we've kind of talked about the laminate and more on the breathability and the waterproof side of things in terms of a shell, but um, Kokona, you know, has a 37.5 insulation as well. So in something like the Puffy, you have that insulation there. What makes um, that insulation different from A, a down, and then B, some of the other synthetics on the market? Well, the, the, the cool thing about the Kokona insulation is that... Uh, you know, I'm not – when it comes to synthetic insulation, you know, Primaloft makes a great product and um, and 
and you know, I got to give them props. But our the Kokona is let's just say it's a similar starts with a similar base, but then once they put the Kokona additive, um, they basically spray it, you know, treat it with the carbon additive. It creates a a layer that just that literally breathes a lot better. I'd say in the neighborhood of you know 15 to 20 percent better and basically what that does is as soon as you start to get clammy on the inside um especially with the shell because the shell is a piece that you do end up you know not taking off or you'll end up putting out a decent effort you know before you take off your shell so for us the breathability was a big deal but basically um the kokona is uh it it just allows you to it allows your body next to skin to transport moisture to the outer layer and then evaporate much quicker than a standalone synthetic. Um, you know, when we started to do this project, certainly that that piece for us was super fun, just because in the mountains everybody wears you know you wear a puffy all the time. It's cold and that's a kind of the go-to layer. But what we found was that. Um, um, we kind of needed to build the piece for the worst situation imaginable. Like down has a place, right? Down works great. It it's definitely compresses more and it's lighter for it warmer, you know, for its warmth. But it's got two huge drawbacks. One, it doesn't breathe well. So if you are like still, you know, walking or, you know, hunting in it and you're getting hot, it, it, it just doesn't breathe very well. Two, once it's wet, it's it's done. It doesn't provide you any warmth. I mean, you can DWR coat the down, um, which is kind of was popular a couple of years back. But then people found out that you know it's still wetted out. Um, maybe instead of wetting out instantly, it took another forty five minutes. But once it got wet, it's still yeah, wet. You know? It's a band aid, not a fix. Exactly, and yeah. it's kind of like. Um, you know, for us, we needed a piece where if a guy fell in the water or if a guy went out hunting and for, forgot to bring a shell and he got soaking wet, it still is going to provide him with enough warmth to get back, you know, because you never know what you're going to encounter. So we just didn't want to have that on that piece. Not saying eventually we won't do a down piece because, you know, it's a nice, it's, it's, it's really light and it's, you know, nice to have in your backpack, especially when you're glassing. But yeah. For us, it just uh, – we're building clothes for guys to go in the woods and get nasty. I mean it could be – you could be out there for you know days and so you know we didn't want to have anything it, – it, it's funny because you know the weight of things is uh, – people talk about that a lot and it's very critical. But if you have one piece that takes the place of two, you know you have one – 18 ounce jacket that takes the pla- place of two 12 ounce jackets you've netted a net loss you know i mean sure. you've, so you've got to the versatility has got to go into things and sometimes in order to gain versatility you've got to gain a little weight and if it if it if if that means that you get to cut out a whole other piece of your kit then you know you've done a good thing so yeah i don't know no i hear you and it's not like you know i think especially on that piece, the weight is reasonable, especially for what it is. I mean, there's, you know, it's not just a super thin shell um, in all places. You know, the fabric's beefed up on the shoulders. If you're wearing a pack, it's going to withstand that and not start rubbing through. Um, Same goes for the arms and some of those high abrasion areas. So again, keeping in mind that, you know, you're getting a product for hunting in. You're getting a product to go off trail and to do some work. And not, you know, just to wear to the ski slopes or, you know, just to REI, you know, yeah. it, all that stuff is, you know, it makes a big difference for sure. You know, yeah. It, it, and and that piece is, you know, we make it as light as we can so you could actually hunt in it, you know. And I think that a lot of times people that that don't really understand hunting clothes say, well, you know, why is that piece 19 ounces? I can get the same piece for 16 ounces in X, Y brand. But the thing with hunting is, is when you're going backpacking, you're walking on a trail, right? You're the entire time. You're, if you go off trail, something has gone really wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas hunting, you, you know, you walk in for, I don't know how long on a trail, but you're off the trail pretty darn quick, you know, and, and you're bushwhacking, I mean, almost every trip. So it's, I don't know, you've got to, you've got to take that in mind. Uh, keep that in mind when you're comparing, you know, a hunting puffy 
to a puffy that's made for, you know, an underlayer for starters, or just as 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 you know, kind of a trekking or backcountry deal, you know? Yeah, for sure. So on the topic of weight, though, I mean, you guys have expanded um, the outerwear and non-merino offerings this year, um, and have some new, more on the ultralight side, um, a few pieces. So one, I guess while we're talking about puffies as well, you have a cir- uh, is it a cirrus puffy? Is that how you pronounce yep, it? Cirrus exactly. puffy. Yep. So tell us a little bit about that piece that's all new for this year. The idea between the the cirrus puffy and the uh, and the ultralight uh, rain jacket was that certainly in the Rockies, a lot of times you will leave in the morning and it's totally bluebird or you know the stars are out, no clouds anywhere. And then, you know, in the midday, it just opens up and pours, you know. And um, and we felt like, the, you know, there was a place. We wanted to make a jacket and a puffy as light as we could that still would work pretty well for hunting um, as far as, you know, durability goes, but also something that wouldn't stay in the truck, you know. Yeah. So <clears throat> the goal was to build a shell and a uh, insulation piece that weighed somewhere right around a pound and a half. You know, this, each of those jackets is about 12 to 13 ounces. Um, but the cool thing is, is that, you know, you might never wear it. And hopefully, you know, you don't have to wear it. But if you do, it, it'll it end up in your backpack for starters. Because the first thing you throw out of your backpack is some heavy jacket. You're like, ah, it's not going to rain today. And, you know, next thing you know, you're five miles back and, you know... 3,000 feet up and it's pouring rain and you're under a tree like bummed yeah. so it um you know the the thing is it's light enough to go in your backpack light enough to hunt in and still pretty quiet but that was the that was the that was the goal behind that for sure yeah no i'm pretty excited about it personally i mean I'm, i was that guy this year who was getting ready to leave the truck in Colorado and be out for seven days. And I'm looking at the weather forecast going, dang, it looks pretty freaking nice. I hope, right. I hope it's as nice as they're going to say it is. And I left, <laughs> I left my storm tight in the truck, but you know, if I had this new one, the storm light, that's significantly lighter, um, <laughs> still has great breathability and water resistance. I, I probably would have kept that puppy in, you know, good chances I would have needed. I looked out this year, but. So yeah. there's the the Cirrus Puffy, the Vapor Storm Light jacket. That's the new uh, rainwear piece that's in kind of the ultralight side of things, right? Exactly. Yeah. So those would, those two would be an awesome combo for sure. They are, and um, they work well. And yeah. and, and for the uh, the Cirrus Puffy, we use 60 gram insulation. We left off the hood. Um, it, it it you know it's another piece that it was we just it. it these two pieces together um, give you a ton of warmth and a ton of you know weather weather resistance or you know it's a great weather barrier so you it does allow you to travel a little bit lighter that's for sure yeah and then on the uh, and then we so basically what we did was we split the the storm tight in half um, we just had some people say oh the storm tight needs to be heavier the storm tight needs to be lighter or this or that and it's just seemed like there was guys that wanted a jacket in case it rained and there was guys that wanted a jacket because they knew it was going to rain the entire time so that's kind of how we designed it whereas the new seek which is the ak the three and a half layer it's made to be you know it, it works it's as waterproof as as you can basically get without having to go to a full rubber suit you know right. it's like what you wear when you know you're going to bc or ak or you know even in the rockies and it's like okay we're gonna be wet boys so you know be prepared because yeah. you're gonna be wearing this jacket all day for days and that was kind of was the impetus to that jacket yeah so um last year's storm tight stuff so you know have two divergent pieces as you mentioned one you took what you had last year on one end you beefed it up and on the other end you kind of lightened it up right is that what what those two pieces are yep yeah exactly okay yeah that's awesome and looking at it by the catalog i mean it looks like you know certainly features are a little bit different in terms of cuffs and things like that but certainly um yeah the beefed up i mean the storm tight uh rated here at 23 ounces and then the storm light is about half that closer to 12 ounces Yep. So, yep. Yeah, that's it's, that's cool. Two great options for sure, depending on you know what you actually need. They are, you know, and we got to update the storm tide a little bit. Um, 
the uh, the sleeves got narrower, you know, as we shifted everything to kind of a shooter's cut, and the chest got a little bit. Um, the whole cut is it's it's not tight by any means, but when we designed the Stormlight in 2011, I'm sorry, not Stormlight. When we designed the uh, when we designed the, um, the Storm Tight. Storm tight, sorry. It's confusing. When he said storm tight in 2011, you know, it was still everybody kind of wore regular bino holders, right? And they, without protection. So when we designed that, we, we designed it with a little bit bigger chest. So guys could zip up their binos in when it was raining. And it's funny because in the past, I'd say five to six years, you know, five years, everybody has kind of switched. I wouldn't say everybody, but largely people are switching to these bino systems that are more protective, that your binos drop into and they, you know, cover them up. And everybody's wearing their binos on the outside, no matter how hard it rains, you know. So we kind of, um, you know, tailored the jacket to reflect that change in gear, if you will. Yeah. Cool. So talking, I guess, about some of the bottoms, revisiting that, one is you had an update to the Canab uh, last year that, you know, took some of those, um, I guess, high stress areas and kind of added synthetics strategically. Um, is that kind of the same pant again, uh, what's being offered this year on the Canab side? Yeah, absolutely. We've had, you know, the Canab, it, the Canab, the problem with you know, all hunting pants is that say if you're hiking out, you're packing something out, you know, and your pants start to kind of sag, you've got a backpack on, you know, you're stepping over logs. It's just, it's tough because it just places so much stress on the crotch of pants, you know, and for us, we really wanted to solve that. And that new stretchy material allowed it to do that, you know, like even in your weird situations or your pants aren't quite all the way up and you've got to like step over multiple logs, or whatever, you know, you still have, um, you still have the stretch. So, you know, those pants have, that's helped them a lot. And then we also added stretch to the back rise of them. So when you bend over, they stretch, you know, yeah, it's a good, um, mobility. I will say this, Kenton, on a personal note, when I got the 2016 catalog and started checking things out, I pretty much flipped my lid when I saw that in the Canabs and then like in the Corgates as well, right? You're offering an option for us tall guys. Yeah, that was, oh, that's dude, been a I'm long time so coming. I'm so freaking pumped, man. Oh, good. We, we've had, um, it's funny cause our, all the Merino stuff, we cut quite long, you know, because just the way people are mobility, they're, if they're drawing a bow or whatnot, and we've had no problem fitting tall guys, with that, I mean, really tall guys can wear our stuff, but the pants have proven to be a bit of a challenge. You know, it's just a different, just just a different deal than than the torso. So, um, yeah, for next year we are offering. Um, they're about three or four inches longer. You know, I think our normal pants are somewhere between uh, about a thirty-one to thirty-one and a half, and these new ones are going to be somewhere between a, a thirty-five and a thirty-six. Yeah. Oh. Man, I'm so excited. I was the guy who was like floating. I really needed a medium in the waist, but then they're extra short and I ended up, you know, scrunching up a large to get some length. And so I'm pumped to go medium tall now and that's probably going to be perfect. Nice. We're going to do that in mediums, larges, and extra larges. We'll all have all those three sizes. We'll all have tall sizes. Yeah, that's very cool. So you mentioned right you mentioned gators a bit back. You have a, a new gator for this year as well. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, we we have a a, a heavy duty gator. We make it in two sizes, and um, basically, uh, that was a fun project. You know, we all out here. I mean, all of us wear gators a lot, so we kind of have all. Everybody in the office kind of has their own little ones they like, ones they don't like, things things that they find really good or bad. So, you know, it was kind of the culminative effort of everybody, and and. Um, we basically made the gators are, are, are Cordura on the inside. And then on the outside, they are that, uh, our new three and a half layer material that we use in the, uh, storm tide ache and the storm tide seek. So, um, no, they're just, they're good. They're really, you know, super beefy, um, strap on the bottom. Um, they're pretty darn quiet. But, you know, mostly they're, what's cool is we have a couple different, two different sizes. So, um, they fit nice and snug yet aren't, you know, like if a guy's got big calves, they don't squeeze the calves. They have a little stretch there and, 
and um, I think they're going to be pretty well received. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I want to dive into a few other things here, but, you know, can't go without mentioning we certainly didn't cover everything that's new in the 2016 line. Um, you guys have other accessories, uh, expanded the women's line. Um, hopefully that's done really well for you guys. Has that been well received? Super. That's been, yeah, people have, that's been great. We have a new, uh, we have a core gets for the women coming out. Um, yeah, no, it's been, it, it was a good project. You know, it was, uh, I think a lot of people kind of went with the shrink it and pink it in their women's and we decided that, you know what, we're going to make the exact basically same thing in the same quality and everything for the women as the men, other than we made everything a little bit warmer. It seems like women in general, just their major complaint, you know, we sent surveys out was that they're, they're just cold more often. So basically everything's, you know, from here forward and, and it's just going to be similar, but maybe a slightly warmer. Yeah, for sure. Well, cool. So, you listeners, again, we didn't cover everything. Be sure to go to firstlight.com, check out all the new stuff. There's um, new kind of like a 3D suit almost. There's, you know, more new stuff for the whitetail guys, all kinds of things like that. Um, wanted to touch base with you, Kenton. We've actually talked a bit um, with Vale Camo in a previous episode about fusion, but if you could just kind of, again, touch on that, maybe for those guys who didn't catch that episode, you know, you partnered with Vale to develop this uh, camo pattern. What was kind of the philosophy behind that? What what were you going for in developing this pattern? You know, we had seen... Um so many different camos and we and, and uh, we're, we were constantly testing camos and kind of figuring out what worked and what didn't work and it just um as people started to pay closer attention to like the actual science of it like let's try to figure out what what the way deer see let's try to figure out the way bears see that you know that that became it's not like we have a absolute you know crystal ball to this thing but they're 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 just got to be more and more science behind the camos and um we'd gone we'd had a couple different people we worked with i don't know a couple different people and nothing was really we didn't love anything and then all of a sudden joe skinner who at the time was working for the army mailed us a pattern and it was just it was really cool and he was he's so passionate about it so into camouflage so into the science behind it um that that and we liked frankly just liked the looks we just you know it it, it had a lot of the concepts that we'd seen work in other camos um from a breakup perspective so um you know went back and forth and kind of tweaked it and tried it and tweaked it and then um you know after couple 18 months or a year eh, it was probably longer than that it's probably almost two years um we came out with veil vale late uh last year um of 2014 around october and um have had it's great it, the, the cool thing about the about veil vale is is that it is it's proven to work equally as well in the east as it has in the west so yeah. if guy if a guy's in a tree with leaves, it works well, and it works really, really well um, in a tree without leaves. And what you'll find is that it's a similar situation that we face in the West. Certainly, in where we live in Sun Valley, um, or central Idaho, say, is that the south side of the slope are all uh, sage and dry grass, and the north sides are dark timber. But, you know, you spend you spend nearly equal amount of time in both. Um, so you need to find... a you know, a solid transitional pattern that will work in two kind of different environments. And that was the, that was the most difficult thing about it. And once we, once we, you know, played with the color palettes and, and went back and forth that, um, yeah, away we went, we came out with Vail. Yeah, no, I I absolutely love it. I'm that guy who hunts Midwest, hunts out West. And that is a camo pattern that has been, you know, very effective for me um, in the encounters that I have. And the other thing I'll say about it, you know, it looks cool. Which, you know, Thanks. unfortunately, a lot of patterns are designed for the hunter's eye and not for their effectiveness. Um, but, you know, I think that this one's both. It's effective and it, you know, has a cool look to it. So I appreciate that. We spent a lot of time on that. It's good to hear. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you guys wanted to learn more about it, for sure, not only fusion, but some of the science behind it, and really some of the science about um, animal vision and camouflage in general, it was actually episode 11 where we uh, talked with Joe Skinner, who helped uh, Kent and the guys design this pattern. So go back and check that episode out. So Kent, before we wrap up, one thing um, that Steve and I usually like to ask and often forget to, but would love to hear from you about is, you know, a lot of the guests that we talk about, you know, they've, you know, been hunting quite a while, they're experienced, they have um, learned a lot in their years. But we're always curious to know as we're always continuing to learn, what's something that you're continuing to learn, maybe a lesson that you learned or relearned this past season as a hunter? Man, I'll tell you, it's uh, 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 it's keeping your head up when you're walking. It's funny because it seems like you um, you kind of get into this rut, especially if you've got a you know you're in a, you're, you're climbing kind of hard, and you know you're kind of in a hurry. You should never be in a hurry, but I don't know for some time you know some reason you always think okay they're right around the corner, but literally it's always keeping always looking it's so easy when you're climbing uphill to just keep your head down and i can't tell you there's nothing worse than coming into the animals thinking that they're another couple hundred yards away and you're sweating bullets and looking down you know the guys that end up killing stuff the most and i think this a lot of times is where you know fitness does come into play are guys that walk within their means i.e they don't they're not like blowing themselves up and sweating bullets. They're walking as fast as they can walk and still hunt because it seems like to me, you know, if you hunt, if you're hunting with a guy who's always walking fast, he's going to be the bumper. He's going to be the guy like, how'd it go? And you ask him, you know, and he'll say, gosh, it was okay. I bumped three groups. It's like, I hate that. That's the worst thing I want to hear. I don't want to hear, I don't, I never want to bump something, you know? And I think that if you just, you know, especially especially elk hunting. If you slow down and you see them before they see you, a lot of times that's it. That's the difference between something dying that day and or you having a story about the great elk you bumped. You know? Yeah, the one that got away. Totally. So I don't know. For me, it's always kind of I don't know. Sometimes you set like ideas of where you want to be at a certain time, but you gotta you gotta wake up early enough to where you can walk slow enough to where you're hunting at all times. So if I had to say that's how I've blown it the most times, I would definitely, I would definitely say that, you know, pay attention. Yeah. Well, that's good. I like what you said about fitness too, because, you know, that's obviously a big thing in hunting these days. And sometimes it's not about, can you do it? It's about how efficient can you do it? And it's kind Absolutely. of like what you were saying. If you're the better shape you're in, the better you're going to be able to move efficiently without blowing yourself up, without getting a lot of breath. And that directly translates into, you know, maybe some hunting opportunities where you're not totally gassed and hunched over and, you know, gasping for air, but you're able to walk efficiently and see what's in front of you. Without a doubt, you know, or else you end up going with somebody who's, you know, you kind of have to partner up with people that are somewhat similar because, you know, if a guy's in that you're with is uber fit he could he could be walking well within his means and then you know you look back and a guy's like sweating bullets looking down like he he's you know entering some fitness event and that's how stuff just that's how you bump stuff it, you know if you can possibly you know you just got to walk slow enough to where you're hunting at all times that's that's that, that that's critical yeah no, that's awesome so what's the best way for our listeners to not only learn more about what's new for 2016, but just kind of stay up to date with what's going on at First Light? We'll have we'll start doing product videos um, probably around March um, that'll go through all the new 2016 stuff, like piece by piece. Like Generally speaking, we'll have a video um, on a, one new piece a week or something like that. That's how we generally roll the stuff out. Cool. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some videos that people shoot at SHOT Show and stuff so you guys can at least get a decent look at the new stuff. Yeah, awesome. So in terms of all the social channels, I know that you guys are there, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all those fun places can yeah. check you out there, right? Always, yep. All right. Kenton, thank you so much for your time, man. We really appreciate it. Oh, right on, Mark. I really appreciate you having me on here and letting me talk about money stuff. I'm really excited. 
Well, thanks so much for listening this week, guys. Again, be sure to send us your feedback or questions to podcast at exomountaingear.com. And if you would, if you're enjoying the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever else you're listening to this. Until next time, have a great week. We'll be right back.